Hello. My name is Matthew Gim from RMIT University from, in Melbourne, Australia. Today, I'm going to introduce Aristotle, um, a logically determined clockness risk 5 RV32I. I'm here with my support, Carl Fund from CCS Research. Okay. We'll introduce Aristotle, Aristotle and circuit oscillations, explain logically determined design and null convention logic. And we show the uh, waveform analysis of Aristotle CPU simulation, and suggest, suggest instruction grouping and new bit allocation for a clockless risk five. What is Aristotle? It is uh, logically determined risk five. That's only what is logically necessary, implemented entirely in terms of logical relationships with null convention logic. A threshold logic uh, with hysteresis behavior that constructs fully determined self-regulating self logic networks through which spontaneously flow successive computations. It is low power and low noise, no clock, no state motion, no flip-flop, no glitching, no wasted switching, and also robust, reliable, portable, evolvable. No, crit no critical timing relations, completely logically determined behavior. Insensitive to variation of voltage, temperature, and fabrication. Only necessary actively, only um, as long as it's, it needs. This is structure of linked oscillations of risk five RV thirty two I. Oh. The route symbols, this is route symbols, is the CPU function modules. Just like normal microarchitecture, we have program memory, instruction decoder, program counter, arithmetic logic unit, and register file, branch unit, load store unit, and data memory. This yellow arrow, this side, always flows. And this blue arrow, this side, flows only when needed. It depends on instruction. How does it work? My support car will explain this. So how does this work, you ask? That, um, it's a different kind of logic. We, be, we begin by defining two logical values, data and null. And null explicitly means not data. And we assign these values to the two electronic values, high and low. Uh, typically, data is high and null is low. And then we define <coughs> operators on these values, threshold operators, um, that demand the completeness of input and have history of state holding behavior. So here's a two of two threshold operator. Um, only when both inputs are data does it output transition to data. Only when both inputs are null does the output transition to null. Otherwise, it maintains its state. All right, so these aren't, um, these aren't functions, they maintain state. This is a two of three operator. Only when two inputs are data does it output it transition its output, and when all inputs are null, it transitions its output to null. So we can define, wow, we can define a set of these, uh, these threshold operators that cover all possible threshold functions of four inputs or less, and this uh, is, our, is our library. This is our language of logically determined design. Uh, this is null convention logic. Uh, so we can make combinational circuits with these, these um, gates, and the behavior of the circuit scales up for the gate as a whole. Uh, first, I have to mention that we only have one data value, so we use multi-rail representation, right? Uh, so this is a, a two-value variable, this is a three-value variable, this is a four-value variable, and only one rail transitions to data at a time, okay? so. It's like this, you typically call this dual rail, but we're in general multi-rail. Um, 
And so because of the completeness behavior of the threshold functions, the combinational circuit as a whole um, exhibits a completeness behavior also. In other words, the output transitions only when the input is completely transitioned. Okay, so when one of these is data and one of these is data, the output becomes data. When they all become null, the output becomes null. So the combinational circuit can detect its own completeness of behavior. Okay, it knows when it's done processing its input. Um, and this means one, uh, one rail has become data or all the rails have become null. And so we can take this completeness of output. Also, there's the flow of the circuit is completely logically determined. There's no races, no glitches, no spurious transitions. The completeness of the individual, um, completeness behavior of the, indig the individual gates ensures that. Okay, so now the circuit can take that output completeness behavior and feed it back and regulate its own input. Okay, so this rank of gates will transition to data only when both inputs are data. So this has to be data and the data has to flow in. And then when the data propagates, okay, uh, blue is null and red is data in these diagrams. Uh, when the data propagates through, these gates will maintain the data. As long as this remains data, these gates will maintain, they'll remember the data as the data, data propagates through the circuit. So here it's propagated through, we detect data completeness, and we go back and we have an inversion here. So it says we're done with the data, now we can allow a null wave front through. The null wave front propagates through, we're done, we're, we're done with the null wave front, we can allow a data wave front to propagate through. So with this inversion, we've turned the combinational circuit into an oscillator. And the oscillator will oscillate between data completeness and null completeness. Uh, monotonically, null completeness, data completeness, um, indefinitely. Also, the oscillator is a ring oscillator, right? So the circuit will strive to oscillate continually, and it will be modulated by its input flow. Okay? Um, so now we can take these oscillators, and we can link them. Right? We can take the, the completeness of one oscillator and put it before the, com the, the completeness detection of another oscillator. And um, this is the linking of two oscillators. So the successor oscillator will allow a wavefront of transitions through and maintain that wavefront of transitions. And now the completeness for this oscillator means that not only is he done with his uh, processing his transitions, but the downstream oscillation has accepted that uh, wavefront flow and is maintaining it. So he doesn't have to maintain it anymore. He can say, okay, I'm done with it, allow the next uh, wavefront of transitions in. So wavefronts of transitions are stably handed from oscillation to oscillation as they flow through a network of linked oscillations transforming as they flow. So we can build an entire system with linked oscillations. And uh, the combinational logic, the coordination logic, and the memory uh, is the combinational logic, the coordination logic, and this is acting as a register, what, what a register normally does, is all in terms of logical connectivity, purely in terms of logical relationships. And it's purely logically determined. It's all in terms of one form of expression. Um, and we can express it as a network of linked oscillations, and this is the RISC-V uh, architecture, and that's how it's expressed. So there's no clock, no flip-flops, no registers, no state machine. It's just uh, a network of logical relationships. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Okay, this is the uh, design simulation. Multi-ray control and variable length instructions. Very hard to see. Um, first block, this is arithmetic logic unit control rays. Second block is register file control rays. And third block is program counter control rays. All control signals generated from the instruction decoder. It's hard to see the waveform. And each instruction has all different lengths. It depends on their input variables. And even 
this can see the, all the instructions for related to the arithmetic logic. Let's say ADDI instruction. This one and this one has different uh, instruction lengths. It's all dependent input, da input data. And this slide introduced the power economy steering instead of, uh, by steering instead of selecting. Um, logically de uh, determined design, basically we use DMUX style, not MUX style. MUX style do everything, MUX discard in, uh, unneeded. Finally they discard unneeded and always presenting data, presenting new data weights of freight time and select desired flow discard rest. But DMUX style is doing steer, do only what is necessary. Basically, it is normally null. And after that, and present the next data steer for function through, through a background null em emptiness. This one is still null, but only this combinational logic is working. Only steered circuit is active. This is the main region of, of, of our low power. This is processor uh, unit activity. Unit activity occurs only when needed. This first line is instruction, Pro, uh, program count control signal. And second line is register file control signal. These two signals is always working all the time. And arithmetic logic unit and branch, uh, branch unit and load store unit is working occasionally. This is il illustrating the steering. This is the example circuit diagram of the program counter. And it, it is interfacing with the instruction decoder, branch unit, program memory, and register file. And it has three oscillator rings, one, two, and three. It's, it has link. It gives the liveness of the circuit. This is a, a simulation uh, waveform of the program counter. This top part is program count increment and this low part is adders. Like you can see the increment and adders. And adders working occasionally, not all the time. And increments are working ev almost every instructions. This is our suggested instruction grouping. Instruction uh, decoder design is entirely related to the instruction set architecture. Therefore, to implement the high energy efficient and high performance CPU, the instruction cores can be grouped more efficiently to generate co control signals. NCR operators have maximum four input variables, such as four of four, uh, TH404. Four four four. Therefore, Four bit variables are ideal for NCL decoders to increase the performance. Four variables for grouping, max, maximum 16 groups, and four variables for instructions, maximum 16 instructions for each group are good for our uh, clockness design. For example, a, uh, arithmetic logic immediate group, SRLI and SRAI instruction, their OP code and function three are the same. The only difference immediate 11 to six parts. To distinguish these two commands, we have to decode 16 variables. It is uh, less efficient for performance area for us. Um, we are at, at this very, at, at the moment we are very early stage, executing compiled quick sort application and of, um, about 400 MIPS. And, is, is, is a performance, and um, we need more optimization for that, for the timing, area, and power. And we have to add su su supervised instructions and place and route floating point unit and branch prediction. That's all. Any questions? My name is John Eaton. I'm an independent consultant. Uh, how do you do manufacturing tests on this? Because you can't do scan testing, and functional testing could take years. If you had tried to do a complete functional test on a complicated circuit, you could be running for a long, long time. 
Well, there is, uh, scan testing is possible. Um, and we have put uh, scan chains in, the, in these kinds of designs before. It, we, we're not doing it in this one. Um, and there was an article at the current async about um, scan, scan testing. It's not scan chains, but it's a method of scan testing so you can just run wave fronts from, you know, in parts of the system at a time. Yeah. So like, like you break up your designs into scannable blocks? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. When you have stages of source and sync and, yeah. Hi, this is Tommy Thorne on Independent. Uh, the design you presented it doesn't use a pipeline, at least not in the traditional sense. Is there ever more than one instruction active at any no, point? No, yeah, not in this design. But it, but it, but it, is, it is pipelined, and I can go into it, but it will do out of order. Um, because we have an emptiness, right? We have a not data state. We can empty a register, and when, a, when an instruction flows along to read that register, it'll wait until that register actually gets written. So the register file itself can act as a scorecard. Um, and also a bit different uh, from normal uh, micro architecture. And our, our instructions, the pipeline depth is depend on instruction. Yeah, so it's a natural pipeline. I showed the linked oscillations, and linked oscillations make a pipeline structure. Yes. It's an asynchronous pipeline structure. But, so it's not the kind of pipeline, you know, stepped pipeline you're thinking about, you're, you're used to, but it's a, it's a pipeline, right? So wave fronts are flowing from the, the um, decoder into the register file in the ALU and, you know, then causing, you know, reading the register file and through the ALU and so forth. And it's all a pipeline structure. It's a very complex pipeline structure, but it is a pipeline structure. <laughs> yeah, in our current design, each uh, link, link is one pipeline at the moment. And yeah. we added multiplier in here. It is variable. And sometimes uh, we can select uh, non-pipeline or two-stage two or three-stage pipeline. Yeah. So you can think of each oscillation up there as a pipeline stage. Yes. Uh, Richard Nickel from BlueSpec. So I, uh, on this slide where you say no flip-flops and no registers, I'm a little uh, unclear about, your ter about how you're using those words because I think you're mixing up levels of abstraction here because even in conventional digital circuits, it's levels of abstraction. At one level, there's no flip-flops and registers. There's just transistors and wires, right? We, we give the name flip-flop or register to a particular pattern of connecting tr transistors and wires. And yeah, the okay. same can be said in your system too. A particular pattern of how you build a feedback loop is something that corresponds abstractly to a register. So yeah. I, I, I don't quite buy the uh, terminology using that there's no flip-flops and registers. It's a level of abstraction. Yeah, well, actually, um, we spent a lot of years calling this a registration stage. And I've decided to change the terminology because it's really completely in, in terms of logical elements and logical relationships, whereas the clocked flip-flops and the, the clocked registers are um, not, not exactly combinational logic uh, circuits. You know, there's something different from the combinational logic. So in RTL design, you've got combinational circuits, you've got registers, you've got the clock. Um, here, all we have is, logically deter is logical relationships, logical structures. So. Um, I've, I'm trying to emphasize that, you know, so if you want to call this a flip-flop, I guess you can call it a flip-flop, but it's not a, you know, not, not the kind of flip-flop you use in RTL. Um, so I had, a, well, I had a comment, but first on that point, I think you could also just say, you can build flip-flops out of NAND gates, so everything is just NAND gates in conventional technology, right? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you could, I think the main thing is you don't have a global clock. That's the, that's the big deal. Anyway, the comment was for the recoding, your instruction grouping. I mean, have you considered just doing a recoding into the iCache? So you can just, you know, run an iCache refill, you get the instructions in standard format, and just on the way in, you can just recode them into whatever grouping or bit mapping you prefer. So you don't have, then you don't have to pay that cost when you're fetching it from the iCache, right? Yeah. Don Stark from Google. So with, you know, with asynchronous designs in general, which this is kind of a, maybe a, a near relative, the, the two questions always are, 
one, what do you do for your tool flow, right? Because asynchronous or you know, non-classical, non-conventional circuits break all the tools we normally use. And the second thing is, at some point, you have to connect with a synchronous world, right? You got to talk to SPI, PCI Express, I2C, you know, all these kind of synchronous interfaces. And what often happens is you lose a bunch of the advantage you, you garnered initially. So what's your plan for handling those two problems? Yeah. yeah. Someday we're going to make the tools. We don't have the tools yet, so you're absolutely right about that. Um, and interfacing with the clocked world, uh, uh, eventually the clocked world will go you get further and further distant. And um, the, the, the logically determined part of the system will get, get bigger. So the bigger the logically determined part is, the cheaper it is to interface, make that interface to the clock system. Yeah, I have a point. Yeah. Um, for the tool, we basically use the Verilog for, for this one, and uh, we don't use the Boolean gate. We have to generate our own um, cell library, and like cell in instantiation, using the cell instantiation, uh, we designed using Verilog. After that, it, it was, we realized it was very inefficient. And at the moment, we are using our, our um, in-house tool in-house tool from my industrial partner. And also, uh, our own language, not, not using Verilog, it, it converts to the system Verilog netlist. And after that, we can use no more uh, uh, EDA tools. Yeah, so there are some tools in development, but they're proprietary at the moment. And yeah. Matthew has access to them. Yeah. How do you predict uh, performance, which is one of the, if you're, if you're running a processor, you need to know the bounds of your performance. And how would you predict performance in this case? Well, you can, um, you can time the, you, you, have can, to time use the, oh, you can time these oscillations. And uh, you can, you know, um, analyze the, the pipeline flow from oscillation to oscillation. So it can be done. It's not anything remotely like what you're used to, how you're used to doing it. But we, we it call can be it, done. Yeah. We call that cycle time. One yeah. cycle is cycle time. Yeah. And because all instruction has different lengths, we are measuring average lengths. Yeah. So you know, basically, you, you, you time the paths, and then you, you add up the paths in a, in a much different way than you do with the clock. Huh? Yes. There are too many different paths, and it's, uh, there is an effect of the instruction mix. Yes. So the predicting it is fairly difficult. Um, well, you got, you, got, you got caches and, you know, multi-issue, multi and, I mean... That's why I mentioned... Nothing, you know, none of the modern processors are absolutely deterministic in their time. Yeah, 400 uh, mega, um, million instruction per second, how many instructions, that, that's our performance measurement. Yeah. I'm always a little mystified by that Be question. Because, because we have no clock, it, it is not yeah. uh, something different from the measure of the performance. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.